Hello, and thank you so much for tuning in to hear me talk for an hour. So thank you so much. Um, I'm very delighted to be here and to be able to have this opportunity to talk to you guys. Um, there's a few ideas I'd like to present today. And uh, the ideas, I suppose, will become more clear once I give a little bit of background about who I am. Now, my name is Randall Plunkett. Um, I come from a very ancient historical family. Um, and we have been the oldest family still associated with one place in Ireland. And uh, as I always tell people who come and visit me, um, if you don't like what I say, that's fine. But if you're going to insult me, it's French bastard, not English bastard. I'm a Norman, so not a Cromwellian. So if you're going to insult me, at least get those correct. So who am I? So I am one of the landed gentry, the enemy, the fat landlord, as people say. And most of those ideas would be correct. But I've also, I'm also a person who has tried to do something with what I've been given. Privilege uh, by itself is not evil, but privilege wasted is very evil. So I was given privilege. So what I've tried to do with my privilege is to tackle one of the things that is the rotting things of our time. And that is our world, our climate, our environment, the crimes that we do against weaker animals and people. And I suppose I started without knowing a journey. And that journey um, led me to where I am today, which is rewilding. Now, in many generations, we've always had problems. We've had problems with poverty. We've had problems with lack of opportunity. In this country, we had starvation. But now we're quite privileged in this country. We have a fairly good standard of living. Um, most people have the opportunity to have education. Most people have the opportunity to go on holidays. We have plenty of food in the supermarket. And yet there is unhappiness. And unhappiness is a strange thing. When you have so much, how can you be unhappy? Well, it comes from the, the basis of where happiness comes from. And I think some of the things I will talk about today will be controversial but I'd like you guys to just uh, come into this with an open mind. So let's get going. So firstly, I have been vegan for almost nine years. I was definitely not vegan. I was in fact quite the opposite. I used to make fun of vegans. I believe I have said the bacon jokes at vegans in the past. And the typical, where do you get your protein? And, uh, oh, you know, it's our nature to eat animals and to have cruelty. We've always had cruelty. And as I got older, I would say those things. And as I got older, I would start to think about the things I was saying. And I began to realize that there was a lot of flaw in my logic. We are not inherently evil. That's just not really how humanity is. And if you look at history, and look at our beings, for example. If we look at how we are designed, we have hands, no claws, occasionally long fingernails or toenails, but not, nothing really dangerous. We have flat teeth. Our jaws grind side to side. We can see color. So we are attracted to sweet things like fruit, like processed sugar. Not by accident. We are prejudiced. We are aggressive. But those things are taught. Those things are conditioned. Behavior largely is conditioning. And I feel, and I had a bit of an epiphany many years ago, and I realized when I had a conversation with my father, my father used to tell me stories about the wild of Ireland. But the things that he saw when he grew up. I never saw those things. And I asked him once, why don't I see those same things that you see? And he said to me, because we've had progress. And as a result of progress, we've had a loss. And I think about progress a lot in life because we are always in the, the rat race of trying to have more, trying to have more investments, protect ourselves 
in you know all these things, these material possessions, these concepts that have become so important in our society, how we measure people. And all of that comes down to a value system. And a value system is very interesting because we have money, we trade money. We think of value systems when we judge people. You know, it started with white is right. Ooh, black, not as good as white. Ooh, Jewish, not as good as Christian. And then it became men worth more than women. Then it also extended to man worth more than animal. Then animal became commodity. And then commodity became traded. And if we boil down human behavior, let's, let's look at the body. The body is a large muscle. You condition the body, it moves a certain way. Yes, of course, there are certain um, physical characteristics that move. You know, obviously, your joints can only move in certain directions. But like any muscle, you train a muscle in a certain way, it will react, it becomes reflex. So I bring it back down to society. We created a hierarchy system to which I'm a beneficiary. I am. I represent the problem. It's very difficult to live with that concept, representing the problem, because it's people like me who have created the system, somewhat the system. And in reality, the system is wrong. It's not correct. In fact, it's actually held us back in many ways. So I go back to veganism. Veganism is not about animal rights. It's not about um, what you eat. It's an ideology of change. It is the higher standard of living because we, when we want something, we can do anything. We've been to space. And a lot of people say to me, ah, but it's in our nature to eat meat. Well, it's not in our nature to go to space. So that's not an argument. We create what we want, the world we want to live in. And I feel that this world that we live in is not correct. And it's not even in our gene pool. The human race is the only species that doesn't find harmony with its environment. I find that very interesting because there is one other creature, I lie. There's one other life form that does not find harmony. And that is a virus. Now, a virus is very interesting. A virus is part of nature's way of reducing the weak, reducing and changing itself. It is a byproduct of change. Now, we could be a virus, that's possible, but I don't like to think so. I believe we are an evolutionary misstep. We are designed for being part of nature, yet we do not follow nature in any aspect. We wear shoes, we, we are fighting against our true diet by consuming animal products and these things like that. We are able to huge amounts of cruelty. And I believe the culprit, and often one of the things I like to talk about is let's boil it back down. When did all these changes start to happen? It happened with fire. So when we created fire, we were able to cook food. We were able to consume more calories. We were able to consume meat because meat isn't very palatable when it's twitching and moving. I mean, unless you're one of those freaks from YouTube, but most people don't have the taste for it. It has no sweetness. Without any seasoning, it can be quite bland. It's not what we are attracted to. In fact, when you ask somebody, how do you like your steak? Oh, people say to me, peppercorn sauce. So we like plants on that. So are you liking it because there's plants on it and it's got some salt and et cetera? Or are you liking it because that's what you, what you like? Now, if you ask anyone, they'll put ketchup or mustard or whatever on their, on their meat. How do you take your chicken? Nando's sauce. Oh, I like it with fried onions. Very telling. So we go back to fire. Fire was created and we were able to consume. We were able to change. We made fast progress. Suddenly our bodies could digest food a lot faster. We in turn didn't have to chew as much because we could consume food. When we were having to eat roughage, we would spend a large amount of time chewing like a cow, chewing, chewing, chewing. In reality, when you were trying to sell gum, one of the 
things that I always remember when I was growing up was chewing gum companies saying, oh, have food and then chew your gum afterwards. And it'll protect your teeth from all that acid that you get from chewing. Now, they say chewing causes saliva, which fixes your teeth. But chewing your food does that. But we don't chew our food anymore because we've cooked it. We swallow it. Now, I'm not saying, for anyone panics, I'm not saying creating fire was all bad. We had a huge amount of benefits. But like anything in life, it ain't free. Benefits, consequences. So when we created fire, we started consuming meat. Yes, survival was made easier. But the truth is, we also started to value things. And our ideology, our understanding created because suddenly the animals around us were a commodity. When we were going around the place eating roughage, that was our survival, but we didn't have the value system. That value system was perpetuated, I won't say caused, but perpetuated by our consumption of meat. Because, and look at it this way, the high amount of protein created more growth. It speeds up growth. A lot of the people say to me, oh, but we evolved when we came to eating meat. We aged. We became more unwell. And when you eat an animal that has died in fear, it releases hormones, adrenaline. You are what you eat. So when you start consuming the flesh of an animal who suffered, who is in fear, you are slowly accumulating these animal hormones and things like that. And that will affect how you think. A lot of people say to me, ah, oh, but you know, you eat soya, phytoestrogens, you're going to become, uh, you're going to have movies. Plant estrogen and plant hormones don't respond to animal hormones the same way. So the changes will not be the same. That's something that I always think about. So we have consumed fear. We have consumed pain and we consume suffering. And our world is full of pain, suffering, and we cause it on a regular basis. Could it be possible that this has originated from you are what you eat? And that's always something that we should think about because as we started valuing things, chicken worth less than the steak, the cow, and then we create names because we don't like accountability. Pork rather than pig. Um, steak or, or, uh, or beef, bacon, because it's hard to say, you know, animal, mother, child. A hard time, a hard moral compass to go. So we create escapes, and that's what we use in language. Language and be under no. Uh, um, confusion. Language is a weapon. We weaponize. We Holocaust denier, climate denier. We weaponize web language. It is a trick that the more, should we say, um, the darker souls in our society are able to manipulate. We alienate by creating groups and subgroups and create value systems. The only way to undo all of this is to boil the problem to its very root. And that's how we value. Because it's not enough that you just give up meat. Because, and a lot of times people say to me, oh, but we have, we are more inclusive now. No, we're not. We are band-aiding a much bigger problem. You have cut a piece of the tumor out, but you haven't cured the cancer. The cancer comes from how we look at things. And a baby in a crib, does not do harm to a rabbit. We learn to enslave. We learn to do harm. It doesn't come naturally. It's a muscle. And like any muscle trained badly, eventually it starts to warp your entire body. From having flat feet, suddenly your back hurts. Suddenly you have headaches. And suddenly you are hunched over. Start to eat meat. Start to do cruelty. You become a warped version of yourself. So how do we change that? We have to challenge the status quo. The, the man, so to speak, uh, doesn't want change. The meat industry doesn't want change. They want to sell you products. They want to keep you sick. They want to poison 
the mind so we can stay in the very same way we have, which let's be honest, climate change is the same. We've got to stop burning fossil fuels. So we've got to have a bicycle. We've got to consume less meat. Half measures never fixed anything. We're way past cutting out meat on Mondays. We're way past cycling to work to make a difference. We have to radically change. We have to change everything. We have to turn the entire paradigm on its head. That is the only way we stop being a virus and go back to the way nature intended, part of nature. And that part, when we can start embracing that, and this is something that I endured myself from being unconsidering of nature, not interested, to not thinking about the consequences of what I have on my breakfast plate. All those things began to change when I removed things from my diet. I started feeling emotions for things. I started seeing connections. The veil was lifted. And then I began to see how we are sick and how our society has become more and more sick because it's consumed. We want more. People go back to history and they say, a oh, hunter gatherers. But hunter gatherers scavenged. And yes, we can survive on, on meat. We can survive on cruelty. But a diet filled with cruelty will create a cruel being. And ultimately, how has society changed? Well, we've gone to space. We have phones. We have no environment left. We are creating our own destruction and we are doing it every day with what we put in our mouth. And we can't have, um, we cannot have the things we want. We want a fair society. We want women and men to be equal and other. We want not to have racism. You're never gonna get rid of racism unless you stop the, the, the habit. If we destroy the, the value system, then you will have true equality because by creating a box system, oh, well, we're gonna have this many women in this group and this many men in this group, and then we're gonna have a transgender in there so we can have that ticked off our box. That is creating a reverse racism that will not work. It will fall down because we haven't cured the problem. The problem is that the little reflex in the back of your brain is still there, even if you try and suppress it. The only way to change is to absolutely change from the ground up. And that starts with how we value animals. All animals are equal. All people are equal. Our society cannot keep going at the way it's going. And remember, this is a beneficiary of the status quo talking. But there will be no benefit to anybody if we have an extinction. And this um, beneficiary can see the writing on the wall. So I have to ask, how do we change? Is it too late? Well, there is a chance that it's too late. But that, if you are willing to give up because it seems hopeless, then you're never going to succeed in life. Because it's, it's the refusal to accept that makes the changes. I was last in my class when I was at school. And I never could barely pass an exam. I spent my summers grinding, grinding. The amount of money my parents spent to have an education. For what? I'm a filmmaker didn't use half my education. I never had to really use any of the algebra that I learned. But I spent the time learning. And eventually, through want, through the refusal, to the not accepting that I was not going to be a flunk out, I managed to pass my exams. I in no way was a good student, but I did it. So I turned back to society. If we refuse to accept what we were given, which is a poison chalice. We can make all the changes. The environment wants to fix itself. We just have to stop fighting the environment. Gardening is a very interesting thing because it's literally madness, literally. Because what do we do? We are structuring nature the way we see it, controlling it from its interior. We tear out the plants that nature wants and we put things that don't belong. And then time goes by and those plants 
pierced through the ground. And then we do it again. And we'll have to keep doing it again every day. And then we die. And then the weeds come back. Insanity, really. To fight against something that you're never going to win against. But we do it. We call it gardening. So I go back to the environment. How do we change our status quo? Our refusal is number one. We have to become more in touch and have, try and see the connections in nature because we don't have any. Because we are too busy on TikTok, Instagram, sitting there watching Netflix and chill, we are asleep. And as a result, we are taken advantage of by people who are much smarter than us. And those people who are taken advantage of us are destroying the very world we live in. They are poisoning. They can complain and you can vote for anybody you want. But unless you're willing to see the lies, the deceit, and how the game is played, you will forever be asleep and you will be a victim of the ruling class. My family is called Plunkett, but Plunkett is a variation of Plantagenet. And the Plantagenets to this day are practically the lizard people. They there with the Rockefellers, the Rothschilds, the, Har the Harringtons, they are the ones who created the railroads. They are the rubber barons. And although in my family, we've always tried to do the right thing, I can't lie about the people that are sharing the same blood as me. But it's not about the past. We have to respect the past, learn from the past, and move forward. What does humanity have to gain? If we go back to nature, if we start adapting, we will evolve. We will evolve. Probably we will be part plastic, part technology, maybe so, but we will evolve and we can have another change and actually live a better life and create a society, a utopian society, if we want. Now, the problem with want is you got to work. A lot of people don't like to work. A lot of people want the easy option. We'll have the the bacon sarni, it's much easier. It's difficult to eat salad for the bacon sarni because it's easier. So effort is made. But if we make the effort, if we refuse, things change. And that's what scares the status quo is the winds of change and the winds of refusal. You know, the Western world changed when the Russians murdered their royal family. It scared the West. And we created, we had to create a boogeyman. So we blame people. We have representatives who are the evil because they distract us from the real problem. Everybody wants to lose weight, but nobody wants to put the donut down. But when you're, the truth is exposed, when you find out that you are the victim of a trick, nobody likes to feel that. Nobody likes to be lied to. And that's what we're lying to ourselves every day. Oh, if we eat uh, steak, if we have these, if we take these supplements, we have to take supplements because we're not doing what we're supposed to doing. In fact, we have to keep spraying pesticide in our garden because we're not doing what we're supposed to do. And that's listen to nature. Nature is connected through fungus. We are connected through fungus because when we move, we are part of nature. We are creating waves, the butterfly effect, if you like. Um, and those waves and those motions and those pulses are part of it. When I have forests here. And one of the things that people have always said to me is like, oh, you'll have to control your deer. Red deer will destroy your forest. And you know what? They're right. Red deer destroy forests. They don't destroy forests in Dunsing. And let me explain. Traditionally, deer had a predator. We killed the predator, the wolf. And as a result, there's nothing to control the deer number. So we have to manage manage kind of like gardening we have to keep managing forever not a great way how's that working for us by the way it's not working every national park is in depletion and the management program isn't working so okay at Dunsany we do not manage manage is gardening gardening is bullshit um so what we did is we allow things to exist because the best manager is nature. This was a very radical idea. So I didn't control the deer. We have tripled the amount of deer now than we had when I started. 
we have doubled the natural regeneration in the forest. There are more trees growing in my forest than ever. How is that possible? More deer means more destruction, yet no. Because by allowing the environment to start to recover, nature functions start to work again. And nature is the best preserver of itself. We start to mess around with nature. It will smite us with hurricanes, diseases, rains. We will be wiped off the planet like that. The moment we start to exceed our, our brief. Now we are getting close. Nature is beginning to get a little upset. Nature functions, it starts to work, changes start to happen. The biodiversity crisis starts to disappear. So by not controlling the deer, I have more biodiversity. I have more trees growing in the forest. And by the way, this is not something that I'm saying. This is something that has been validated by Trinity College. Um, and what we did notice as a result of this is the deer have now focus their attention on destroying the invasive species in our forest, which is absurd because things like cherry laurel are highly poisonous to deer, yet the deer are controlling it. I do no managing of my forests. Take a bit of firewood from time to time. I take a few pieces of wood and I carve them for things. I fix my roof occasionally. But the truth is much of the forest is allowed to rot. Rot creates food, creates opportunity. And it is part of the cycle of life. We, when we farm, if you look at how we farm, we tear up the soil, which breaks all the delicate structures. We stick seeds, manufactured by one of maybe five companies, by the way, refined to the limit of, of what is possible in a laboratory. It starts to sound a lot like what happened with the potato famine. We over farm. You have now Chinese people eating avocados and, and French fries and drinking milk, something that they never did before. We in the West are eating rice and noodles. So the food system has become pretty much the same all, all year round and all world round. It's become a system, a cycle. The problem with that system is when it breaks, it will really break. Because we are farming only a handful of seeds and crops, and we are over farming it. You know who over farmed? The people who had the potato famine. And we all know what happened there. Um, the problem with this system is that we, although it's great to have avocados every day of the year, but there's a cost to that. And that we are slowly being alienated from seasonal foods, from the less exotic foods that grow in our country and we are starting to eat things at all year round of course more destruction more pesticides more additives every single time and we are slowly creating a toxicity to the soil which is reducing how nature works when we plow and we destroy things we sever nature's ability to work when plants are under diseases other plants come to the aid because we cannot figure this out ourselves but plants, even in opposition of communities. And the forest is a city of plants, a city of trees, and they do what's best for the overall. Sounds like a community to me. And as a result, going back to the forest and the deer, I was noticing when I planted trees, gardening, uh, I would notice that the deer would often attack those and eat those bastard deer. Plant a nice oak tree, looks amazing. Come back a day later, top of this gone. But I noticed they weren't doing it in the forest to things that were seeded. So I took a little experiment. I, I grew some oak out of seed. So I took oak seeds from a forest, one of mine. Okay, nine feet total. Oh, some baby has had enough of me, wants to go home. Anyway, I planted nine seeds, grew them out, say big, and I took three, seed, uh, three oaks and I planted them in one forest, three oaks and planted them in another forest, and three oaks in a third forest. And I planted them in between naturally seeded oaks. And you know what happened? I came back 30 days later and the deer had eaten all of my oaks in all three forests. But the oaks that were naturally seeded were untouched. 
untouched oak, same size, same vintage, same trees, or at least same mother tree. When you plant a bare root tree, you use a shovel. You stick it in the ground and you part the ground. You break open the ground. You are severing the delicate fungus structures in the ground. Then you insert a tree, a foreign tree, and you squash it all down, compress the soil. But it could take years before those fungus structures attach themselves to the tree. So that tree is essentially disconnected from the system, from the matrix, if you like. Um, so as a result, it doesn't have protections from the trees. And another thing, we've noticed the system works. So when a tree is under attack, take an oak, for example, when it's under attack from an invasive species or not an invasive species, if it's attacked by a species, let's say a beetle, for example, it gives off smells and tastes within an hour. Some of those smells and tastes will attract things like wasps, Wasps kill larvae, very important part of the system. Um, there's a lot of oak trees dying in Ireland today. Do you know why? Because we have a beetle that comes and eats the bark from underneath, leaving air and uh, humidity to get in, which creates rot. Rot and fungus are one of the biggest destroyers of the trees. They are also one of the most important parts of trees. But they have no natural predator because the predator that would normally eat those beetles are the woodpecker. So by having woodpeckers, for example, we are able to protect the integrity of the forest, remove these animals. We have nothing. And we try and plant trees together, close canopy, like Quilsha. And by the way, Quilsha spent 1.5 million euros last year on pesticides, pesticides that come to an American company that has the ethics, well, of the Nazis, basically. Um, and we pay a fortune to those companies who have us held ransom. And then we spray things and we wonder why nature doesn't work properly. And then we say, oh, we need conservation. We need all these things. Well, actually, if the system started working correctly, we wouldn't need any of those things. And one of the things I am most interested in is adaption. Nature is a lot like a person. You stub their toe, they'll balance on one leg. It'll be a bit messy for a while, but then after a while, adaption happens. You can stand on one leg. Like with reflexes, like with muscles, it all starts to work. So we remove something from the system. There has to be a reshuffle. Something begins to do something that something else wasn't doing. Okay, the reshuffle, or as I like to call, adaption. These are interesting things that we are noting here at Dunsany. My project, this rewilding project, is one of the only vegan rewilding projects in the world today. It's large scale. Because if we want to change, we have to change everything. We have to remove how we kill things, how we create cruelty and treat everything equally, whether it's a tree or a plant, because we can easily fall into bad habits. So every so often I have to take a step back, take seven breaths like the samurai have said to do before any major decision. And you wonder, what is my goal? And what am I doing? Am I beginning to want to control again? Because that habit has been bred into us for generations to think it's going to disappear just because we wake up one morning and start eating tofu instead of scrambled eggs. It's not. So we have to be constantly at war with ourselves. But guess what? It starts with simple change. Simple change leads to a second change, then a third change, and then suddenly society has changed. Nine years ago, when I started being vegan, I was on a journey and now I meet people every day. People are abandoning people. I met a girl today. I'm on the film set, by the way. The reason I look like this is I'm about to start a new movie. And my actress said to me, she's like, I'm making the change. And I asked her why. She said to me, because I know it isn't right. Because I know it isn't right. So it's not that we don't know. We know deep down we do that we're doing something wrong. I think everybody does. People resist because they don't like change. Nobody wants change. We fight change with every ounce of our being because it's so much more comfortable to have the status quo. So easy to make the easy decision. But the easy decision 
will give you a heart attack. The easy decision makes pain and misery a normal thing, and we justify it to ourselves. But we don't like to see dogs get murdered. We don't like to see people uh, doing harm to children. Do we really want to see the same for animals? Because remember, and people often quote the Bible at me, and I love religion, by the way. I love all religions. And most religions have one thing in common. I'm, by the way, I do not demonize religions. I believe it is not what's written. It's what who has been speaking that is the problem. And the Catholic religion pushes that the Lord created a planet. And this was a gift. Life is a gift. And it was bestowed upon us um, munchers down here. And instead we treat it with disrespect. Now, if I created something for somebody and they exploited it, they enslaved the things, the creatures, the other guests who have been given an opportunity to exist, we enslave that, we create concentration camps. I destroy the rivers, I destroy the land. Oh, because God wants to be honored. God wants to be accepted, wants praise, wants respect. But the truth is, even God wants you to walk a higher line. Veganism is the highest line that we are capable of at this time. Because it means that ethics, we have created a society that has ethics can become more than just survival. It is what we live by. It's the ethics that will shape us into the next state of being. But religion, religion tries to bring out the best. It can sometimes be misinterpreted. It can sometimes be wrong. But if I was God and I gave a gift and that gift was destroyed and exploited and the other guests of my creation were enslaved, you know what I would do? I would spike humanity with every ounce of my rage. I would raise the waters and swallow you whole. So I find it very ironic that Christians and Jews and Muslims talk about religion and all these things, when in reality, their own texts tell them to live better and respect the ones around you. Yet, the misinterpretation of others is the problem. See, we only see ourselves, so we can only see our families, our children, or whatever. We forget that others also extends to the animals, the environment. Now, I believe in nature. Nature is the real God here. And however you want to interpret God, that's up to you. But nature is my God. Nature gave me life. We fight and kill all the way around the world for dirt. Remember what I said, language is a weapon. That person isn't worth dirt, but we kill for the dirt. Dirt is what feeds us, yet we have utmost disrespect for dirt. Dirt is what is the most expensive and valuable commodity. And is what's going to save us or kill us. Because with the dirt becoming more and more toxic, we'll start to be more sick. With less and less dirt available, we will start to get aggressive amongst ourselves for it. So the disrespect of dirt has to stop. We have to start looking. Biodiversity is not a flower meadow. That is some bullshit Instagram stuff to sell products, products and seeds that often have fungicides, the very things killing the planet. So you think you're being good for the bees, but you're gardening again. And we all know what I think about gardening. No. That's not gonna work. So we have to change our ideology and only by changing our ideology, then things become much easier. We have technology, we can feed the people. We have to stop lying to ourselves about saying that we have a food crisis. We waste 50% of the supermarket. There is no food crisis. We can feed, people can drink, oh, well, you, we have to have milk. No, we don't, we have, can have soya milk. Oh, but soya destroys the rainforest. Most of soya is used for cattle. So there, we could have, Every person on the planet could have soil milk on tap, and we still wouldn't even scratch the surface of the damage done by the meat industry. And also, there are many different things. Oat milk, soya milk, oat milk, uh, almond milk, cashew milk, 
cocoa milk. We can have anything we want. We have the technology. I have seen burgers that look like meat that actually bleed. Now, personally, I think it's a bit perverse myself, but if that's what you want, we can make it because we want to. We want to create something. So when there's want, there's a solution. So we have to just stop lying to ourselves. And I see someone talking about water. Yes, water is a valuable commodity. And it's no accident that Nestle has been buying up all the water. But also, water and dirt go hand in hand. And the thing is, is that we are killing the seas. Oh, but you've got to have sushi. Fuck you and your sushi, to be fair. I have sushi all the time. Avocado, cucumber, whatever. This obsession with fish is another big thing. Oh, but fish don't have the feelings. They can avoid pain, so they have feelings. We ourselves are at a crossroads of, of change, and we have to really look at it. And I always said something that I really like. And Hemingway, I, I'm, I'm big into literature, and Hemingway once said, there is nothing noble in being superior to your fellow man. True nobility is being superior to your former self. And that is for me something that is true because it's not about being better. It's not about, it's about trying to make ourselves better because we should have standards. People say that we're nothing, we haven't changed in history. I feel that that is a massive injustice to the human race. We can be anything we want, we just have to want. And maybe not everybody wants yet, but like the world is changing for us, we have no choice. There is a freight train coming. And if we're not careful, it'll hit us full force. So the wake up time is happening. And probably it may be too late, but only if we're not willing to make those sacrifices and change today. Now, I think most of the people who come here probably think I'm a loon. But the truth of the matter is, is that we are well capable of change. I have changed. And I see changes happening out there. And there's nobody that can't make a change because everybody has a windowsill. Everybody has a garden. And if you don't have a windowsill, you have a tabletop. We have to create food. We have to create life. And we have to embrace life and stop focusing on destruction of life. We have to create new ideas. When there's a focus to change, there are solutions found. There has to be that focus though. And Netflix and chill will only make you sick. So I am going to shut up and anyone else have a, something to say? That was a marathon of talking bullshit. So you can keep asking me some questions. Anyone? I can talk for another 20, 30 minutes if you want on this. Talk about